Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. This Populist Dialogues cablecast program's purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. I am your host, David Delk. Today we will broadcast video of a Pulitzer Prize winning jur investigative journalist, David K. Johnston, shot when he was here in Portland recently speaking at the First Unitarian Church. David K. Johnson is author of three books on taxes and tax policy. His first book was Free Lunch, How the Wealthiest Americans Enrich Themselves at Government Expense and Stick, it, stick You with the Bill. His second book on tax policy was Perfectly Legal, the Covert Campaign to Rig Our Tax System to Benefit the Super Rich and Cheat Everyone Else. And his most recent book is The Fine Print, how Big Companies Use Plain English to Rob You Blind, published last year. His topic here in Portland was Rise of the Monopolist, Why the Few Get Rich While Your Paycheck Shrinks. He spoke for over an hour, so we're going to bring you two programs featuring David K. Johnson. So be sure to watch for part two next week. I'm going to tell you things that some of you may say to yourself, oh, that can't possibly be true. And everything in my books I can trace back to the public record. I don't expect people to agree with my interpretations, but on my facts, I was able to show problems with them, or where they have some very minor little details, we fix them right away. Uh, some of you may, and I hope not, cynically say, oh, we all know that. To which my answer is, yeah, because I spent the last 20 years trying to dig this out so you know. <laughs> but more importantly, it's not good to have that attitude, in my view, because cynicism doesn't change the world. <laughs> and before I get into the details of this, the most fundamental message I want you to think about is the whole idea of our country whose six noble purposes were written down for us in the preamble of the Constitution, is that we can solve our own problems. We got rid of slavery, which is in our Constitution, without using the word, in at least 12 different ways. Defense and the support and the maintenance of that awful institution. Women got back the right to vote. Somehow they persuaded men to give them back the right to vote, which they had had in some of the colonies. It took 72 years of hard work, principally by two women, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, mother of eight, and uh, Susan B. Anthony. We got child labor laws, even though the Jerry Falwells and Pat Robertsons of 100 years ago went around saying, if you are in favor of these child labor laws, you are an agent of the devil, for it is God's plan that these children should work in these factories. But we got child labor laws, and it only took half as long as suffrage. We got really good environmental laws signed by a Republican president. Although if Richard Nixon came back today, I suspect that the current Republican leadership would say, oh yeah, he must be a friend of Dennis Kucinich. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, I want to tell you that this book is the end of a trilogy. Perfectly Legal, which I came here and spoke about nine years ago, is about the tax system, how the tax system in America really works. We have two tax systems, separate and unequal. One is for most of us. Our taxes come out of our paychecks and our pensions before we're paid. Uh, the government has automated most of it. It's very efficient. The other tax system is for the incredibly super wealthy, many of whom legally live tax-free, many of whom arranged to pay their taxes in the distant future, and whom Congress trusts to pay their taxes, unlike you, because all of your financial information is verified and independent. Free lunch, a lot of which is about Oregon, particularly Bandon Dunes and Portland General Electric and Enron, is about subsidies that go to people at the very top. This book is about the rise of monopolies. It is about what is going on in the American economy. We have a myth, it didn't used to be a myth, but we have a myth in America today that anybody can go into business and do well. 
and that we are a nation of entrepreneurs and people who want to be job creators. In reality, we are a nation in which the very biggest corporations are getting state legislatures, Congress, and regulators at both the federal and state level to rewrite historic rules of commerce. Some of these rules go back to Hammurabi's time. And what they are doing is seeing to it that you can't compete with them, that they can charge you taxes that never go to the government, but stay with them, that will allow them to raise prices even if the economy is falling. Economists call this market power. That will see to it that you lose your legal rights if you are in some way damaged or harmed. And that allow them in all sorts of ways to gain, not by building a better mousetrap or providing a better service, but by mining your pockets and wallets and mining the public treasury. Now, to understand what's going on here, I want you to imagine something for a moment. Imagine that somebody comes running through that door right now and says, have you heard the news? They just announced on the radio. There's this comet coming they haven't seen, and once it gets dark, the whole planet's going to light up everywhere as it turns dark for a whole revolution. It's going to be an incredible light show. So we don't go, oh, okay, well, the guy better be done before the sun goes down. And when it's over, we'll go outside and go, wow, that's incredible. And we'll go to bed. Years go by. And we suddenly notice, you know, there are certain people, one in a thousand among us, and they're not aging. They don't get sick. They become immortal. They can get in a crash and bleed out and die, but they're immortal otherwise. And you know, there's another curious thing about these people. They become amoral. They're not moral. They're not immoral. They're amoral. They'll do whatever the rules say. They're indifferent. And you know, the third, third funny thing about him. You remember the, the, this guy you knew who was like Bill Clinton horn dog? And he doesn't care about that stuff anymore. Or this person who was so passionate about art. They don't care about that anymore. Or this person who was like totally into being mother. All they care about is making money. It's all they think about. They focus on it. They're really good at it. They're making tons of money. Well, if that happened, we would have to change all of our laws of property because they're all based on the principle that there's a human lifespan and people die. Because if we didn't, these immortal people would bit by bit acquire all the assets in the world until they owned everything they wanted to own. The only things they wouldn't own were things that they couldn't figure out how to make money on. Well, we have those immortal beings among us. They're called corporations. A corporation is immortal. It doesn't get sick. And you know, even if it runs out of money, we have zombie corporations now. We take them to a bankruptcy court. We infuse them with cash. If they're too big to fail banks, we see to it that the government loans the money at a very low rate, and then they borrow from the government at a, at a higher rate, and they make money. We prop them up. They are amoral because by themselves, they're not human beings. And all they're about is making money. 2,600 corporations out of the 6 million corporations in America own more than 80% of the business assets. Now, this is not an argument against corporations. We want to have corporations. They are efficient, effective vehicles to create wealth, to encourage risk. They're good things to have. We do not want to go back to the rules of ancient Sumeria. And I teach the law of the ancient world in the law school and the business school at Syracuse University now. Where if you couldn't pay back your debts, you would be sold into slavery for three years. And in some cases, you, because it was only men who took on debts, your wives, your concubines, and your children would all be sold into slavery. But if you think about this, and you could do it for three years, if you think about that, it's a kind of bankruptcy law. How do you discharge a bankruptcy? Nobody's going to loan you more money than they can get out of you for three years from the number of people who are covered by the particular loan. We don't want to go back to that. We want people to say, I'm going to risk this money, I'm going to invest it. If I lose it, I lose it. If it works out, I'm going to make money. But we don't want to have corporations be our masters either. 
The idea of corporations, the proto-corporations, began in ancient Rome. The emperor would say to someone, I hereby appoint you general in charge of suppressing the, maybe oppressing the Iberians, or proconsul in Palestine. And while you were gone, someone had to manage your property. So they created corporations, more like trusts, but somewhat like corporations. And they had corporations for commonly held property, community property, not in the sense of a marriage, but a community, a commune. If you go to Rome today, you see the signs, Communa de Roma. This idea was that the corporations was created to serve the state. In America, we have inverted that, and now the state exists to serve the corporation. What's happening as a result of this is that these corporations, because they're driven totally by money, they have no conscience except that of their officers and directors, are doing what they're here to do, and that's to build up and acquire assets to make money. I recently did a column for nationalmemo.com. It's a newsletter you can get for free. There's over a million people who subscribe to it. It's serious. It's not intellectually serious, but it's not fault at all. You're not going to read about the Kardashian sisters there. And it was a graphic from the Federal Reserve Bank in St. Louis of labor's share. At the end of the year, the economy has pursed a certain output. Part of the share goes to capital, part of it goes to labor. And what that showed over a 60-year period is that labor's share went along like this, and then Reaganism came along, and then George Bush came along. Meanwhile, I ran below it corporate profits. Corporate profits go along like this as the economy goes up and down, and they start going like this after Reagan. And then we hit 2010, and if, even if you had a very successful corporation, this was the year to clean up your books, get rid of any bad books. Nobody's going to notice it. You take care of stuff, you know, just become a pain. They drop like this, like a rock, and then they go right back up to record levels of a kind we have never seen in the history of America. We have gathered up so much money at the top because of the rules that we have. Up until 1986, Congress said corporations could only keep a certain amount of cash. It wasn't defined by dollars. It was what do you reasonably need to run your business. If you kept more than that, you paid a penalty tax, a 15% penalty tax. And there are thousands of cases of business people who were taxed by this. But 1986, in a law that no one wrote about at the time, Ronald Reagan signed a thing that said, asterisk, this doesn't apply if you hold the money offshore. Now, you want to know why Phil Knight takes the tennis shoes they make in Hanoi and while they're on the boat to Los Angeles, sells them to a company in the Cayman Islands and takes all the profits there? This is why. You want to know why Apple takes half of its profits and shifts them to a company in Ireland, that is legally resident nowhere in the world, has no employees, and is managed from Cupertino, so it doesn't pay taxes. By the way, all that money that's supposedly offshore, it's right here in the United States. The companies send the money to banks in New York, the too big to fail banks, and say, go buy us U.S. government treasury uh, securities. But because the statement says Cayman Islands, Singapore, Ireland, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, that money is not taxed. So let me explain to you that this is how corporations profit off the tax system. Imagine that you bought a house here in Portland 30 years ago, in 1983, at 1983 prices. What's a nice a price for a decent house in Portland in 1983? $200,000 or might you buy? How much? $65,000. And what would it be worth today? Five hundred thousand. Let's say let's say sixty-five to six hundred fifty thousand. Make it easy. That's ten times the figure. So imagine you bought that house in 1983, and you paid the property taxes on it, and the insurance, and you cut the lawn, but you didn't make any payments on it all these years. And then this year you had to pay sixty-five thousand dollars with two thousand thirteen dollars. You think that deal would make you rich? Without even selling the house, just all those years in the house without paying for it would make you rich. You really paid, by the way, uh, 
uh, something on the order from 1983, of about $25,000 to $30,000 for that house. Well, here's what Apple's done. They have $36 billion of untaxed profits offshore. They take those untaxed profits, they send them to the bank in New York, they buy treasury securities. And if 30 years go by, at 3% compound interest, they will have $87 billion. They will pay their $36 billion tax bill, and they'll have $51 billion. See how easy it is to profit off taxes? You just pay them in the distant future. Now, let's look at us. Our government borrowed the $36 billion it didn't collect. Remember, Apple bought the debt to cover the $36 billion. They loaned us the money. And we paid 3% a year for 30 years on that money. Okay? 3% a year for 30 years. Well, we've now paid back, all, for all practical purposes, 100% of the money, $36 billion. And now we collect the $36 billion. We're out. They're profiting. And every one of these 2,600 big companies is doing that. But because they're amoral and they're immortal, and the rules allow this, that's not enough. So in 20 states, including Oregon, there are laws that allow corporations to take the state income taxes deducted from their workers' paychecks and keep the money. Now, if you haven't heard about this, it's because the Oregonians never reported it. Uh, there's a bill called Senate Bill 219 that passed in 2011. And I was told tonight by Jody Weiser there's actually two more laws. I have a vague recollection I know about, but I want to focus on this one. These laws have been in place since 1989 in, some, in, in the earliest state that started this. And it's spreading everywhere. Everywhere in the country we are seeing this happen. The biggest state where this is going on is New Jersey. New Jersey gives companies the opportunity to keep the state taxes withheld from their workers' paycheck if they'll move the job from New York over to New Jersey. And the problem is, New York and New Jersey have a tax sharing agreement. People work in New York and live in New Jersey, they don't get the taxes anyway. 2,700 big companies have these deals. Basically, every one of those 2,600 companies, plus all the Canadian banks, Deutsche Bank, one of the biggest promoters of tax shelter, fraudulent tax shelters in America, the Communist Chinese banks, Electrolux from Sweden, Nissan, Toyota, Honda, Goldman Sachs, they all have these deals. Not at every location, but here and there. And here's how incredibly lucrative these deals are. No state has put limits on these in a serious way or told the public about them. And so in Ohio, where you have the anti-tax conservative John Kasich as governor, General Electric is getting $115 million that it gets to keep that are withheld from the taxes of its workers. And it is using that money under their deal, because every one of these is an individually negotiated deal, to refurbish a jet engine factory. They're going to spend $126 million. So the taxpayers are putting up 92 cents out of every dollar, 92% of the cost of this modernizing of the factory. Now, if that factory earns an 8% annual profit on the whole investment, it means that GE makes a 100% annual profit on its investment. You know what the average rate of return in America is for all companies on their assets? 6.7%. They're getting 100%. And it means somebody's kids didn't get new textbooks in school, or the teachers didn't get a raise, or the roads have potholes in them. But hey, if you're a GE shareholder, this is a fabulous deal. And GE, to my knowledge, is the only company that's told its workers what it's doing. Because every one of the laws these states pass make no requirement to tell the workers. You have the taxes withheld from your check. You paid your taxes. The company then gets a tax credit, or in a couple of states, a loan forgiveness. That's the one here in Oregon. Or it, gets a, it has to turn the money over and get it back. But those are just the mechanisms. 
you paid your taxes, the company gets the taxes from the state. And it is spreading like wildfire. And you know, I first wrote about this in Reuters when I worked for them for a year as their worldwide economics correspondent in the summer of 2011. I did three different videos about it for them. Not a word in the New York Times where I used to work. Not a word in the LA Times where I used to work. Not a word in the Washington Post. Not a word in the Wall Street Journal. Not a word in the Oregonian. Nowhere. I'm virtually alone. There are a few small newspapers around the country where reporters of 50,000 circulation papers have written about it. Nobody knows about this. And that's one of the reasons it's spreading. Now, at the heart of the idea of the American economy is competition. Adam Smith, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, taught us that in his era, the idea was wrong that everybody was taught to believe, and if you had lived in Scotland in 1776, you would have been raised up to believe the following. That the only way the world gets better is through selfless acts of Christian virtue. And there were heavy acts of Christian virtue because, of course, Jews and Muslims and, and others, they, they don't have virtue. They're not Christians. And Adam Smith said, no, that's wrong. It's markets, competitive markets. It's the butcher, butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker competing against all the other butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, and with consumers who can make choices about who to buy from that makes these people become more efficient. And in an effort to become better businessmen and to make more money, it is as if, as if an invisible hand is guiding the market toward a general improvement for all of us. The goal now is to handcuff that invisible hand. To make sure that you don't have to compete. Because there's nothing businessmen hate more than actually having to compete. I co-founded with my sons a little tiny business. I'm a job creator. <laughs> 25 jobs. At least for half the year. And we manage a hotel on the boardwalk in Ocean City, New Jersey. We don't own it, we just manage it. There are a set number of hotels in town. The island's fully developed. My worst nightmare is somebody figures out how to assemble a large block and builds a big hotel because that would be more competition, we would have to lower our prices, and our profits would go down. That's how business people think. They don't want to have competition. Much easier to make money if you're a monopoly. It's really easy to make money if you're a duopoly because people think there's competition. So in 1980 in the United States, we had 37 big railroads that are classified by the federal government as Class 1 railroads. And a Democrat from West Virginia named Harley Staggers got a law passed known as the Staggers Act that said, you know what we need for the railroad industry is we need more competition. So today, instead of 37 railroads, we have six. And two of them are extensions of Canadian rail lines that don't have any great influence on the economy. That leaves four. You only see two of them out here on the West Coast. You only see two of them on the East Coast. So what we really have are two duopolies. Now, you think, well, at least there's two. You can pit them off against each other if you're a shipper, if you're a manufacturer. If you need to move goods, you know, you say, well, what price will you give me? No, no, I want your price. So Lafayette, Louisiana is the capital of Cajun country. My French ancestors, they're from Lafayette. Places like that. And in the 1880s, Thomas Edison's financier, J. Pierpont Morgan, would not bring electricity to places he didn't think he could make a lot of money in. So Philadelphia got wired, Atlanta got wired, Lafayette, Louisiana, little Louisiana, we're not going there. So the town fathers, and in those days it was the town fathers before the uh, 19th Amendment, um, 19th, 16th Amendment, voted to create a municipal electric system. Something you have lots of out here in Oregon. And they own a coal-fired power plant. And they buy coal from uh, the mines in Wyoming. And you know there are two railroads that run from the mouth of the mine all the way down through Kansas and across and come down to the banks of the Red River in Lafayette, Louisiana. 1,500 miles side by side. And then for the last 19 miles, there's only one railroad. Well, that's okay. You just pay the monopoly rate for the last 19 miles, right? You get whichever will give you the better deal, and if you have to switch lines, you just switch the rail cars, and you pay a monopoly rate for 19 miles. No, 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 no. 
the federal regulatory agency that handles this adopted a rule called the bottleneck rule that says if even one mile has only one rail line, you've got to pay the monopoly rate for the whole trip. It gets better. The terms of the contract by law are secret. Even though it's a government agency in this case, the Lafayette Utility System owned by the city government, the terms by federal law are secret. And of course, we all know that if anything promotes competitive markets, it's going to a store where there are no prices on the wall, right? What the city of Lafayette can say and does say is that they believe if they had competition for the first 1,500 miles, they would spend $6.5 million less having coal. Now, is there anybody in this room to whom $6.5 million really means anything? You can feel it in your spirit. Yeah, I know what that is. Oh, well, there's always... Well, let me give you meaning to that amount of money. It's enough to cut the property taxes of every single property in Lafayette, Louisiana, 10%. 10%. That $6.5 million that is sucked out of the economy of Lafayette, Louisiana, a city a quarter the size of this one, and shipped to Omaha, it damages that city's economy, but it benefits the owners of the two railroads, which are both based in Omaha. Or one of the two railroads. This kind of mechanism is all throughout our economy. Today we've been watching David K. Johnston as he presented at the First Unitarian Church on this topic of rise of the monopolist. Why the few get rich while your paycheck shrinks. Remember that next week we'll bring you the second part of his presentation. Don't forget that you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the link with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows and to subscribe. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. Thank you for watching. See you again next week. Bye.